Okay, now on record, before I move on, please, am I audible? Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, we can hear you. We can hear you. Very good, let's share the screen. And then go to our group, group eight. Our course syllable. The schedule of work. So this is a summary of what we've gone through in the semester. At the beginning of the semester, we talked about different types of sentence-shaped thought. You know, we saw the different kinds of um, expressions. Um, let me see. Speech acts, we saw interrogatives, imperatives, we saw um, declaratives, factual statements, definitions, value judgments. We saw the two kinds of moral, uh, sorry, two kinds of value judgments. We saw emotive expressions and sentence fragments. Um, so uh, we practiced how to convert one kind of speech act into another. And you might um, be in need of that skill going into your IA or exams. Now, just give me two seconds. Let me put my phone away from me. You know, these phones generate um, radiation energy and they undermine our health. So anytime I'm not talking with my phone, I keep it at a long distance from me. Yeah, so I'm back. So that was what we did for speech acts. And then we went into definitions. For the definitions, we saw the different types of definitions. We saw the lexical, we saw the theoretical, we saw the ostensive, we saw the operational. But before we started treating the different types, we saw uh, the distinction between definiendum and definience. We said the definiendum is like the subject, the definience is like the predicate. So the definiendum is what is being defined and then the definience is what is actually doing the defining. And from there, we looked at different types of definitions, lexical, the dictionary definitions, we saw the ostensive definitions, those ones you cannot go by word or by speaking or writing. And then we saw the theoretical definitions, those that originated from specific disciplines. Then we saw the stipulative definitions you can formulate at any given moment for any given purpose. You know. Then we saw the operational definition, uh, you know, those definitions that uh, outline some procedure or operation. Then we saw the essential definition, which we said is the, uh, which we said that the only definitions we call the real definitions, but they are found mostly in mathematics, you know. Uh, they are the only definitions that are completely accurate. Every other uh, definition is uh, 
essentially contestable. From there, we discussed problems with definitions. There are different problems. Definitions could be too broad if the items being used to define the definendum go beyond the definendum, then the definition is too broad. But if the items used to define the definendum do not exactly cover what is covered by the definendum, then such a definition is too broad. I mean, sorry, too narrow. Then we saw definitions that are vague, you know, when there is no way of telling what class of things that I, the definience is referring to. We saw ambiguous, uh, you know, ambiguous definitions, definitions that present more than one possible meaning of something, you know. And then we saw secularity, which is uh, definitions that uh, repeat the definendum as definience. Morality is to be morally right, you know. Then we saw definitions that beg the question that, that is definitions whose definience is obscure or digresses from providing meaning, you know, or doesn't help in shedding meaning on the definendum. Then we did some exercises. So that was for definitions. After definitions, we went to we went to discourses, different types of discourses. The discourse. Um, Slides are here. Types of discourses. We saw that the discourse is basically a passage. We were saying that there are two categories of discourses who have argumentative and non argumentative. And then we said an argument is a discourse that contains um, a conclusion and premise or premises. We, we gave examples with arguments, we learned how to identify arguments with or without uh, their indicators. Then we move to non-arguments where we saw narratives, instructional passages, rhetorical polemic. So for the narrative, it doesn't need any explanation and even instructional passage. The rhetorical polemic we said it's a collection of emotive expressions we were saying that um, one thing that um, rhetorical polemic has in common with um, arguments is that both of them contain claims, could contain claims, you know. But when we see a claim in, um, in rhetorical polemic, it is usually surrounded by emotive expressions. We did some exercises and then we solved verbal and real disputes. We said verbal disputes are those disagreements that arise because of uh, the, the confusion about the meaning of something. It's either one of the parties don't understand the meaning of something or probably the meaning of something is not even clear and has not even been resolved by the entire humanity. You know, There are some concepts that are not completely clear. So those ones, you can't resolve any verbal disputes that arise from them. But the real disputes are not disputes about meanings. They are disputes about facts or about values. So that was what we did with types of discourses. And from there, we went to see the six senses of law. And I think uh, to see the six senses of law, we treated the normative and uh, the empirical. Here, we, we also talked briefly about facts and values. And here we're saying that there are some factual statements that are actually value statements or value judgments. You know, there are some, there are some statements that have all the properties of factual statements, but there is a single word that you can put in them and it will transform them from factual statements to value judgments. And we give examples. The president has lifted a lockdown is a factual statement. The president has rightly lifted a lockdown is a value judgment. 
So then we went to metaphors and proverbs. We said metaphors are sentences that shouldn't be interpreted literally. We gave examples and then we said proverbs are, proverbs have literal meaning actually. Unlike metaphors, proverbs have literal meaning, but they also have non-literal meaning. So proverbs have both literal and non-literal meaning. So they are multiple purpose speech act. So the major difference between metaphors and proverbs is that one, proverbs have literal meaning, but metaphors don't, you know, or rather we don't really consider the literal meaning of metaphors. And then in addition, proverbs provide some kind of advice. We saw examples. Then we went to meaning defects. By meaning defects, we mean problems like vagueness, ambiguity, and then we saw referential ambiguity, sentential ambiguity. Then we saw equivocation. Equivocation is to take advantage of ambiguity. Ambiguity is that something that has more than one possible meaning. And then when you exploit it in a particular situation, then you have committed equivocation. You know. Then we saw the six senses of law. We saw natural laws, civil laws, cultural norms, customary law, moral law, logical, mathematical, and divine laws. You know, so that was what we did with um, the third, our third class. And then for our fourth class, we, or rather, that was what we did for our fourth class. And then for our fifth class, we went into um, arguments. So in our fifth class, we launched into deductive reasoning. So this was where we started the argumentative part of the semester. You know, we explained deductive reasoning. We gave an example. We distinguished between reference and attribute classes. We distinguished between finite and infinite reference classes. We distinguished between universal and particular statements. We talked about validity. We compared deductive to inductive argument. We saw the, we saw how an inductive argument differs from a deductive argument. Yeah. Then we sought how the hidden conditional if and then work, you know, how it works and how it um, influences arguments, how arguments can be read or reread in conditional terms. And then we saw antecedents and consequence. We learned how to uh, identify antecedents and consequence in arguments by identifying them in the major premise and then uh, analyzing the rest of the argument based on antecedents and consequence. You know. And because of that, we now arrived at the rule for deductive reason that we can only affirm the antecedent and deny the consequence in order to reach a valid conclusion. So based on this, we outlined four types of uh, you know, two types of uh, deductive arguments. We saw modus ponens, we saw the fallacy of uh, denying the antecedent, we saw modus tollens, we saw the fallacy of affirming the consequent. So two forms and their fallacies. Then we went over to hypothetical syllogism. When we were discussing modus ponens, modus tollens and their corresponding fallacies, we were using all kinds of graphs, images, we were even using symbols and words. And then uh, from there, we launched to hypothetical syllogism. We saw how hypothetical syllogism works. The consequence of a particular premise would be the antecedent of the next premise. That's a hypothetical syllogism. And then the conclusion will bring together the very first antecedent and the very last consequent. Well, then we saw two hypothetical fallacies and how they work. Then we saw disjunctive syllogism, which is very simple. It is so simple that you can't even have a fallacy of it unless you decide to do something that is obviously uh, naughty. For instance, you say either I became a reverend father or I got married 
I became a reverend father, so I became a reverend father. That's the only kind of fallacy that you can come in there, which really is not, you know, not even children can will do that. You know. Then we saw validity versus soundness. What makes something valid? What makes something sound? You know, is validity soundness? Does soundness need just validity? We saw all that. Um, so that was basically the end of the the end of the lesson. Then we stepped up to inductive reasoning. We were saying that unlike deductive reasoning, inductive reasoning doesn't really respect any rules between uh, the premises and the conclusion. You know? We distinguish between verifiable and confirmable statements. We say the verifiable statements are normally the premises, the confirmable ones are normally the conclusion. And we say the conclusion of deductive arguments is not only called uh, confirmable statement, we also call it hypothetical, or oh, sorry, hypothesis. They are the kinds of hypotheses we make which we want to confirm or disconfirm with research. And with that, we noted that um, inductive reasoning is normally the reasoning that is used in science. In fact, it was, in, it was talked about by uh, uh, Mill and uh, Hume. Then we saw two kinds of inductive arguments. The ones that end with law-like hypothesis and the ones that end with statistical hypothesis. We saw there are different uh, uh, advantages and disadvantages. Then we saw different types of extrapolations. We said inductive arguments are extrapolations. And when you talk about extrapolations, you can talk about Pathole generalizations, which consists of hasty generalization and um, and this, uh, syllogisms, you know, statistical syllogisms, or you can talk about analogies, and then you can also talk about predictions. These are all extrapolations. Then we saw the inductive arguments that end with um, with uh, law-like hypothesis as conclusion. We saw how they work. Then we saw the ones ending with statistical hypothesis as conclusion. We saw how they work. And then we were saying that the ones with statistical hypothesis as conclusion appear to be safer to advance compared to the ones that end with law-like hypothesis as conclusion. So that was what we did about inductive argument. And then we moved over to causal reasoning. We're saying that causal reasoning is a kind of inductive argument, a special kind of inductive argument that is reasoning from cause to effect and sometimes from effect to cause. And uh, we saw different senses of the word cause. We saw proximate cause, contributory, necessary cause, sufficient cause. We saw probabilistic cause, causal agent, causal chain and web. You know. Then we saw the, the three kinds of informal causal reasoning patterns. You know, we were saying there are five actually proposed by John Stuart Mill, but we we studied three, which are very interesting. We saw relevant difference, identifying a difference in the environment in order to explain a problem. Then we saw common thread, which is to identify something that is common to all cases that are of a particular type or all cases of a particular problem. And then we saw concomitant variation, which is to see if there is something in the environment that is happening at a degree that is unusual so that we can see if it explains a new problem in the environment. After that, we went to see causal fallacies. Yeah that is bad causal reasoning. You know. We saw post hoc ego propter hoc, that is the fallacy of thinking that just, be, just because something happened before another, then it must have caused it. Then we saw non-causa, pro-causa, which is to exchange cause for effect. If A caused B, you begin to say that B caused A, that's a non-causa, pro-causa, you know. Then we have oversimplified costs. You know, when you are not able to identify all that cost something, you just identified only some or even just one. 
that oversimplified course. And we saw false common thread, which is uh, a common thread that is not true. You know, if for instance, you assume that um, those who are bright in a class are bright because they have cars. You know? So if you want to be bright, you have to get a car to see if you'll be bright. You know? Then we saw confusing correlation with causation. And we were saying correlation is not always causation. And we saw slippery slope, that is, when you argue that something will lead to something more serious, which will lead to something even more serious, and then the order of seriousness continues to rise without any justification. That's slippery slope. And then I think that was the end of that class before we went to informal fallacies. By the time we got to informal fallacies, we are treated quite a number of fallacies. We saw fallacies of meaning, we saw formal fallacies, we saw causal fallacies, we even saw some inductive fallacies, you know, such as hasty generalization. Then we went to see some other kinds of fallacies. You know, we saw grandstanding, the ones we've not seen before, grandstanding, appealing to majority. We saw ad hominem insulting people instead of, uh, you know, uh, accepting or rejecting their conclusions with premises of your own. You know, uh, that is praising or insulting people actually instead of addressing the argument, addressing people instead of addressing arguments. That's ad hominem, whether positive or negative. We saw illegitimate appeal to authority, uh, saying some someone someone is right because he has a superior training or qualification. And then we saw genetic fallacies, saying that something is right or wrong because of where it comes from. It comes from this place, so it must be right. It comes from the other place, therefore it must be wrong. You know, so that's genetic fallacy. Then we saw appeal to threat, which is saying that someone should accept your argument, otherwise something will happen to the person. We saw appeal to pity, which is to whip up sentiments. We saw three fallacies of manipulating the data. We saw misplaced vividness. We saw semi-attached figures. We saw history generalization, and I think that was the end of the semester. So now we will take some questions. Anyone who has any questions to ask can advance those questions. We'll address them. After, after which we would post this video to your site for those who couldn't make it. And then they can also um, take part in our revision. So any, any questions, if you have a question, raise your hand and we'll quickly address it before we, we round up. Yeah, Rosina. Hello, sir. Hello. Yeah, Rosina. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, so please, during our second um assignment, yeah, I both both attempts the system logged me. The system kept refreshing my work anytime I tried to submit it, and due to that, I had no marks. And I was wondering if something can be done about it, if we can redo it or anything. Yeah, and when were you doing that assignment? Um, the second assignment. I did it on Wednesday. At what time? Around 11 a.m. to p.m. Yeah, so that's your fault because you did it at a time I advised you not to. My advice was that you do it between 12 and 2 a.m. Essentially because the internet is under pressure during the day. Uh, so uh, we'll think about a makeup after the IE. Okay, sir. All right, so any other questions? And um, your IA is coming up on Monday. Abu Bakari. Hello, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Um, please, have you marked the second assignment? The second one? Yes, please. Yeah, it is marked immediately you submit it. Um, but please, with the first assignment yesterday, I checked and it was 
zero over um 20 but when i checked um today it came eight over 10 that's for the first one the first assignment but then the second assignment it's still 10 so i wanted to confirm if you've marked it yeah so your first assignment is eight over 10 yes please and your second assignment is what it's zero over 10 like it hasn't been marked it doesn't show anything of being marked okay did you see them as separate scores or did you see them as a single score um separate okay so if it is separate that means that um, nothing has appeared in your second assignment yes please and you are sure you answered the questions yes please i did and i even um for evidence sake i took a, a picture of it and also a video of it yeah what i'll do is i can log into your assignment and see which ones you answered okay sir yeah and besides for all those who think they didn't uh, perform well or who didn't who think they didn't perform at all or get the chance to do the assessments to think about something after the IE. Any other questions? Hello, sir. Yeah, Good Nathan. Nathan, you can go ahead. Yes, sir. Say please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Please. Um, I wanted to ask you if Was that Abubakar speaking or Nathan? Hello, sir. Good afternoon. Yeah, were you the one speaking, huh? Yeah, yeah, I'm the one. Okay, so I thought you were the last person and I hey, was. Please, um, I wanted to ask you people. No, I. Wasn't the one. Yeah, go ahead. Hello. Yes. Can... Yeah, your internet. Yes, the internet is not very good, but just keep uh, talking. I, I, I will understand it. Okay, sir. Please, um, I wanted to ask you if you could explain, re-explain the. Uh, which one? Hello, sir. Yes, which one? Which yes, one the you? metaphor and then proverb. Metaphor. Metaphor is something that we don't interpret according to the, the specific words. You know, but proverb you can, you know, you, 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 can, you can also find the specific words meaningful, but also it has a non-literal meaning. The reason why we don't interpret metaphors literally is that sometimes it doesn't sound very reasonable. When you say it rained cats and dogs, cats and dogs don't fall from the sky. So it is not good to interpret it according to the specific words, but to interpret it according to some other non-literal meaning that we all have agreed you know, something like uh, it rained heavily. But in terms of proverbs, you can actually interpret it literally because the, even the literal one, the word by word interpretation is still reasonable for proverbs. Yeah. Most, all proverbs have reasonable literal meaning as well as the non-literal one, you know. But for metaphors, the literal meanings are normally not, uh, not very reasonable. Okay. Okay. Yes, and then and then, and then remember that remember that proverbs also offer some kind of advice, but metaphors don't. Uh, okay. 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 Well, yeah. thank you, sir. You're welcome. And then Millicent. Um, the second assignment, the system was locked. 
several results. And for the school for the food, I didn't get my school for the first assignments as well. Ah, you didn't Please, get can your... you hear me? Yeah, I didn't get your score. Okay, then. Say, yeah, uh... for the first assignment. Okay. Uh... The scores on the day is just dash over 10. And the second assignment, the system was blocking me out, so I wasn't able to do it. Which one, your complaint is not clear. Which one did you not get your scores? Is it the first? The first assignment, assignment. the first one. Yeah, so why do you think you get your scores in the first one when I told you it is manually graded? Okay, and the second one to the system was logging me out. By what time of the day did the system log you out? Around 11, 10, 11. Yeah, so go and read my messages about that. And then Joseph. Sir, good afternoon. Yes. Um, sir, please, I wanted to ask um, about finding the antecedent and then the consequence in a sentence. Sometimes a question like um, an argument comes in a certain in a complicated form. So, do you have to um, do you have to do you have to change the sentence into a conditional statement form? Like, do you have to change it from a, a categorical statement into a conditional statement for in order to find the antecedent and the consequence? Yeah. Yes. Uh, for, if, 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 the, if the premises appear to be too complex and you don't know which one to, you don't know which one to categorize into antecedent and consequent, then you have to, you have to try to convert each of the premises into conditional. Normally, it is only one premise that you can convert into conditional. The others will not be able to convert into conditional. So it is that one that was able to convert into conditional that you can say, OK, the first part is the antecedent, the second part is the consequent. You know, but normally for people who are very sharp, you know, just by looking at the different premises, you already know which one, even without conditional, you already know which particular premise is the antecedent and the consequent. You know. It's just okay, that, sir. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, it's just that. You know, to avoid to avoid making a mistake, you can you can convert to conditionals and see in order to confirm which one is really contains the antecedent and the consequence. Okay, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and then um, I know. Is it Anno or Anno? Your hand is raised, but. Um, yeah, you have a mic, so you can you can. You you don't have a video, but you have you have an audio. So you can you can ask your question. Ano. Okay, so. Uh, now, Abu Bakari has uh, finished. Abu Bakari, do you still have something to say because your hand is still raised? Yes, sir. Yes, oh, sir. Yes. Please, uh, if I heard you right, you said on um, Monday we'll be having our eye. Yeah. And I wanted to ask if whether it will be covering all the slides, like the all the topics, or oh, it has a specific... It will cover more of those ones you've not done in uh, the first two assignments. You know. Okay, okay, sir. Yeah, so if you know the kinds of questions you encountered in the first two assignments, then you can expect less of those types in the IE. Um, sir, please, are going to be objectives? It will be multiple choice. Okay, thank you, sir. You're welcome. And uh, Ajiman, Ajiman's microphone was on, but it has... Ajiman, do you have a question to ask? 
Uh, sir, please, I was asking if it's going to be objective and you answered me, sir. Okay, that's good. So, so I think that's it. So now I'm about to, okay, Prince Lamte. Hello, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Sir, please, is today our last meeting? Yeah. Oh, okay. It is. Well, I didn't have any questions. Mary Sasa. Sir, please, can you explain declarative sentences? Oh, that one, uh, you don't need, is, is it so complex? Sentences that uh, provide information. When you are providing information, instead of trying to get someone to pro give provide information or trying to get someone to do something, then you, that's a declarative. Okay, sir, thank you. You are welcome. And remember to watch the video and do the exercising bordering on do the exercises bordering on that so that because you might be tested in that area. Okay. Yeah. And then someone there, so this person has no name, just a Zoom user. The Zoom user who raised his hand. Can you ask ask your question? The person that is um, whose hand is coming after Prince Lamti. Look, he has posted his question in the chat. Let me see. Okay. Let me see. Yeah, so the first assignment is still being graded. That's why you have not seen your marks. Gloria. Gloria, do you have something? Yes, sir. So please, I wanted to know if the IA will be, will be um, given like um, a range of days to do it, or it's only Monday that you are supposed to take it. It will be the same range as the other assignments. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you, sir. All right, so. And, and please, how many questions? It's 30, right? Yeah, it will be 30. It will be 30 points, but I don't know how many questions yet. I'll decide if the number of questions that will give you 30 points. Oh, okay, please, okay. Um, and then, um, okay, so I'll be ending the class and uploading the video. I uh, wish you the best in your exams. Study hard and be good. Remember to obey all the moral principles as you chat your cadres. You know, so that you contribute to the country and the continent. Okay, so goodbye. Goodbye, right, sir. Bye, sir. Bye, sir. Bye, sir. Bye, sir.